Good morning, everyone. Uh, Welcome to Brownsville United Methodist Church. Today we have uh, a visiting uh, pastor, Reverend uh, Terry uh, Stewart. And the announcements today are that we have Bible study at uh, with a light dinner at 5:15, followed by the prayer circle at 6, and then the actual Bible study at 7 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, we've got Lord's Diner on October 24th, and the sign-up is still uh, going around. <laughs> <laughs> Any other announcements? Yes, Helene. And that's at Trace it in. Okay. If you'll join me, our first hymn today is This is My Father's World in the United Methodist Hymnal number 144. And we have our uh, display again. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship, a refuge amid distraction. Like an ant on a stick, both ends of which are burning, I go to and fro without knowing what to do, and in great despair, 
Like the inescapable shadow that follows me, the dead weight of sin haunts me. Graciously look upon me. The love is my relations. Amen. The Christian scripture reading is Hebrews 5, verse 1 to 10. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must either sacrifice his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take it this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said unto him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also to, in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Machalitz. In the In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from the death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he began the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Zach. Good day. It is now uh, children's time, and we'll sing the first verse of Jesus Loves Me as the children come. Hmm? No children. <laughs> okay, so we're supposed to do our own thing, I guess. Okay. Well, we sure do appreciate Lydia coming down here this morning and her dad coming with her. So have you had a great week? Yes, I did. Well, tell us about your week. What did you do this week? Um, we have a good food and we have a good time. That's just great. And last Monday you went to the doctor, right? Dr. Bright. Dr. Bright has been here several times uh, to the church, and that's one of Lydia's doctor, and he's very nice. And then we went to the bre to breakfast afterwards because it was a 7:30 a.m. appointment. Uh huh. So. You have anything? <coughs> okay. Well, I maybe anything else you want to tell everybody, Lydia? Lydia's moved to a new home about uh, three weeks ago. That's why she's telling us how good the food is and so forth, because she's, she's very happy. She liked the old place, but this one's even better. So I guess that's it for us today. If you join me in the hymn of the world, word, uh, in the faith we sing, 22, 23, they'll know we are Christians by our love.
The Hebrew scripture reading today is Job 38, verses 1 to 7 and 34 to 41. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds? so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so that they may go and say to you, Here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clouds cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions, or when they crouch in their dens, or lie in wait in their convert. Who provides for the raven its prey, when its young ones cry to God, and wonder about the, for the lack of food? and covering what you do and don't do. So go to a new place every week. It's a constant discovery. Can you go turn the mic down for me? The DK. Uh, no, I'm asking, and be able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. At my right hand, or at my left, is not to grant. It is. It has already been prepared. This. And said to them, "You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them." You. I wish.
I'm going to read you more scripture. So, uh, in my name's Terry Stewart. I am appointed to work with youth affected by incarceration. And I am taking uh, the doctoral program with Pastor Cindy, so that's how we met. And she asked me to come, and she gave me a clean slate to talk about many things. So I am going today to tell you a little bit about what I do. But we're going to start out with a piece of scripture from the book of Jeremiah. And this is from my new favorite Bible translation, which is called The Voice. And it's a storyteller's Bible. So for those of us who like to tell stories, and I might be one of them, (laughs) it's lovely, lovely to read. Jeremiah 31, this is what the Eternal has to say. There will come a time when I will be the God of all the clans and families of Israel, and they will be my people. That is what I, the Eternal One, declare. My people who survived the sword found grace as they wandered in the wilderness. When Israel went in search of rest, I appeared to them from far away, and I said... I have loved you with an everlasting love. Out of faithfulness I have drawn you close, and so it shall be again, my beloved Israel. I will build you up, and you will be rebuilt. Today's scripture is summarized in its opening sentences. So there comes a time when I, the God of all the clans and families, and they will be my people. I will be the God of all the clans and families, and they will be my people. That means all of us are family. We are each other's friends and families, and that includes the kids that I work with that are are incarcerated. So there's this thing called the ACE test, A-C-E. It stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. So to get a perfect score on this test is not what you want, right? You start at zero, so that's life. I can't imagine anybody has a zero score on the ACE test, right? And then 100 is the highest. The average score for the ACE test for youth who are incarcerated is 92. So then I hear verse 2. My people who survived the sword found grace, and they wandered in the wilderness, and I know that that is for my kids. It is up to us to meet them in the wilderness of their lives and to create sacred space. Sacred space is kind of a physical and energetic meeting place where your mind and your body and your spirit come together to realize personal and divine grace. That's what my massage therapist says. I think she's pretty wise. (laughs) Joseph Campbell describes sacred space as that place where you can find yourself again and again. I talk about sacred space as a safe and healing space that develops in my ministry and it's between two or more people. It's a dialogue. So dialogue can be sacred space. Most of my time is spent with the youth at the King County Juvenile Detention Center. So. One time, I was sitting in detention during the youth's free time, and the kids get one hour of free time a day. So generally, I like to honor their free time and not make them go and, you know, do, like, counseling speak and all that kind of stuff. So I was sitting with them doing one-on-ones, or I decided not to make them do one-on-ones, so we decided we were going to play games. What everybody needs to know is that my grandparents were card sharks, and they taught me to be a card shark. (laughs) So I like to play cards with the kids, and I usually win, which is always fun, because they never think that the little short chaplain lady is going to beat them at cards. So this one night, I was in the youth hall, and I sat down with a group of boys who were playing cards, and I joined in with them, and we were playing spades. One of the young men at the table I had talked to a lot of times, and so I had an existing relationship with, and I knew that he was getting out the next day. And I asked him, What are you going to do tomorrow? Now, the top ten list of things I'm going to do tomorrow starts with going to grandma's for food. If that's not available, I'm going home for food. Next is I'm McDonald's for food. (laughs) So they all involve food. But on this night, I was surprised. What I got was 
I wish I was going home to a normal family. It was kind of like a dagger to my heart. I asked him, what do you mean? And I kept dealing those cards out. And it felt like sacred space had just opened up over that table in and amidst all the busyness that was happening in that hall. He told me he knew that if he went home, his mother, who was a drug addict, would ask him to do drugs with her. And he had just come clean, and he did not feel strong enough to say no to her. I asked him about his father. He said he is a member of the gangs. If he goes home to his dad, he didn't think he would live to see the age 21. We heard his story together in dialogue at that table. And I let the silence build up as we continued playing. And it seemed as if Jesus was sitting right there at the table. Throughout this whole process, to ensure that safe and sacred space was maintained, even amidst the chaos, I tried to be calm and look happy and be relaxed and not project my own feelings onto him. But most of all, I tried to listen with what I call the third ear. Well, I, I don't call it that. St. Benedict called it that. He's a much wiser person than mine. He said, listen with the ear of your heart. Eastern philosophy offers a, a, the third eye as the seed of wisdom. And it's something beyond listening just for the words and formulating a response. It becomes an endeavor of your entire body. Sacred listening. Listening with compassion, with the ear of your heart, is the most important skill when working with people who are affected by incarceration. Meeting people where they are is not possible without compassionate listening. Supporting, volunteering, and mentoring is not possible without compassionate listening. Reflecting back into the world, mercy and justice is not possible without compassionate listening. So one of the things that happens when you listen is you hear problems. And if you're listening with the ear of your heart, the Holy Spirit will suggest answers. And as we hear in verse 4, one of the answers was, And so it shall be again, my people. I will build you up, and you will be rebuilt. So how do we build up people? Kids, the homeless, like I heard earlier. People who have been hurt so badly. So by compassionate listening, we found that there was a great need for transition planning for the incarcerated youth. Some mentor volunteers were tired of meeting with youth week after week and having no connection to what the reality was in their lives. So they brought this concern back, and after listening to the juvenile detention center, their ministry needs and with the church's needs, the, you know, church structure, we developed a program called MAP. MAP stands for My Action Planning, and it gives trained mentors matched with youth, and they develop transition plans for when they leave. So they're making a map of their future life, right? So we call them mappers instead of mentors, and mappies instead of mentees. And I get to be a matchmaker. I match mentors, mappers, and mappies. So that took a lot of dialogue between a lot of systems because it was the Pacific Northwest United Methodist Church system, it was the Archdiocese of Seattle, it was the King County Juvenile Detention Center. Lots of talking going like this at each other. But dialogue means we need to talk with each other and listen compassionately to the concerns that rise up and to answer them and it created sacred space, and now I have 15 volunteers working at Echo Glen, and we just started working at Green Hill, which are state facilities, and we, of course, have King County Juvenile Detention Center. So this all started in my internship a thousand years ago, it seems like, when I was getting my first degree, or my Master's of Divinity, going through seminary. It started there because I entered into this sacred dialogue with everybody and didn't just tick them off and say, they're done. I know what the King County Detention Center is going to say. They're going to say no. They said yes. I know what the church is going to say. They're going to say no. 
but they said yes. So we listened and we dialogued. The Youth Chaplaincy Coalition grew out of that moment. It was my final year of seminary, and I was doing a, a, my final internship. I had to do three internships because I was crazy. So, not really crazy. But I did uh, two master's degrees, so I altogether had to do three, uh, three internships for those. So during my final internship, which was to be focused on leadership, I worked with a guy named Reverend Benny Wright, and he was a, a pastor who was on the verge of retirement, and he was trying to leave King County Juvenile Detention Center as a leader. We talked a lot about what was needed, not just for the kids, but for the volunteer chaplains. It was easy to see that there was something missing for the Protestant model because we had worked right alongside with the Roman Catholic model. They are very organized. <laughs> Protestants like cats, right? <laughs> so the Protestant model was confused, but what happened was there was infighting over the messages to tell the kids. You would have one chaplain go in and say, God loves you, you are loved, and then the next chaplain would come in and say, these behaviors would lead you to hell, right? So, and then they would say, that chaplain, especially Protestants and Roman Catholics, they would point fingers back at each other saying, they are not Christian, really. This was horrible. Like, the thing that happened was that the kids were suffering because they were getting contradictory messages and there was infighting and misbehavior with the chaplains. This is not a sentence I thought I should ever have to say. Misbehavior of chaplains, right? But it was true. So I would meet with Reverend Benny Wright every week and we brainstormed what we could do and that's when the youth chaplaincy was born and we have been building it as a coalition to reach across the state of Washington and transform the state of the youth lives with mercy but also to transform the state of Washington with acts of justice and making their situations that they return to better. So that means going outside of the walls of detention and persuading others to come in Right? So in doing this and learning this, I discovered the loop of facilities that youth rotate through in the state of Washington. And I can almost meet all of them in uh, Echo Glen and Snoqualmie. So you can have a youth arrested here, and they might go to Echo Glen or to Green Hill where they will encounter me or my volunteers that I have now trained. Then they will go to group homes that are scattered all across the state of Washington before they come back. So there's this big cycle that we are all part of. What you touch here, I touch there. So if we work together and dialogue and create something new and innovative that is a community that comes together to form a foundation that these youth can live and step out into, we can transform the state of Washington. Maybe I will set my eyes on national stuff someday, but not yet. So in this whole process, I've been building partners. I even partner with International Smile Power, you know? The dentist people, right? They have a lot of volunteers that go into detention centers. So using them, we have leveraged relationships and in going into places we never thought we would go into. I formed a new partner with, uh, who knows about the Rotary, right? You know the young adult version of the Rotary is called the Rotaracs? Right? Okay. I didn't know that till this year. <laughs> so we're partnering with the Rotaracts to come in and do mentoring on Monday nights. Right? So those are things that can affect the system by changing one life. You change the entire world. So the problem was, at the time, we were able to work with youth. And we're sending them back home, though, to the same situation where they're not able to get jobs, where their parents were difficult, and where they didn't really have a welcoming and nurturing place. And as we listened to youth, we found the number one problem was their ability to get a job. I mean, this was after 2006 and everything was going crazy anyway. You layer in felony records as a youth even, and they really can't get a job. 
So what we worked on last year was passing a law that would help them seal their records. Prior to that law being passed, which was implemented in July of this summer, 7% of the youth in the entire state of Washington were able to seal their records. But it was passed this year where we can narrow that, and it's just an administrative hearing, so the judge can do it on their own. They don't need the youth to try and figure out how to get there. And they also eliminated a whole bunch of fines. So youth don't start out as an adult already in debt to the uh, justice system. So we did a lot of work to help make those lives better. Our next step in the process from A, making acts of justice, is to uh, eliminate this thing called a juvenile decline. So juvenile decline is when they turn 16 and they are, if they're arrested, they automatically have a decline hearing. A decline hearing is when they decline to treat you as a juvenile and they will treat you as an adult, right? So we think youth are youth. Their brain development is such that they should be treated as youth. They are still developing until the age of 24, honestly, 25. Let's treat kids as kids and not treat them as adults. Plus, we know that youth that are sentenced and arrested and treated as adults recidivate at higher rates than youth that are treated as youth. All bad ideas. Let's not do bad ideas. All right? Can we say amen? Let's not do bad ideas. I mean, right? So that is kind of our next step. And all of this, while we're tra uh, working with youth to transform their lives, acts of mercy, and working with the justice system to transform the state of Washington, acts of justice. So part of that sacred space is that transforming, transforming the kingdom into acts of justice and mercy. And so we do this on both levels. We reflect back into the world what we learned through compassionate listening, and we have created truly sacred space. So returning to that first definition of sacred space that I offered, it's a physical energetic and divine meeting place where the mind, body, and spirit come together to realize grace. This compassionate listening process is divine grace. God calls the people, all of us, to act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen? You'll join me in the prayer hymn, Jesus Walked This Lonesome Valley in the Faith. We sing number 2112. Now's the time in worship.
come together as a community, as one, and share our prayers of joy and concern. Jesus told us and promised us that whenever two or more gather together, he is there. So he's here listening. What would you offer up? I would like to start by a prayer for those youth that are trapped in the situations you've just described, to be in a situation where they don't have a nurturing home and, in fact, a home that tears them apart instead of putting them together. They need to be in our prayers. God, in your mercy. Bob and I just got home from a uh, road trip. We went out to Whiteface, Montana. And on the way, we passed through the, uh, the forests that are being attacked by the, what's the name of the beetle? It's killing off the trees. And you walk or ride through and look up across the way and see what had been and what it has become. And it, it's a concern, obviously. But one good thing coming out of it is that apparently they're able to harvest this beetle-killed timber and use it for building. God, in your mercy. Uh, I think we need a prayer for some of the folks in our community who really haven't haven't found the light. Uh, we're kind of under attack in Brownsville, at least over by the marina. We've had theft after theft, including a car and tools and anything that's not nailed down. So uh, if anybody lives in that area, uh, keep looking out. But uh, I'm sure this pro person probably has a, a drug problem or something that really needs help. God, in your mercy. Uh, for, for the young people of our community, uh, uh, there's so many young kids that have gotten into trouble and need mentoring, like you've been saying. And so I'm urging everybody to attend that meeting at Tracyton on the 22nd at 7 o'clock. It's one thing to wail about bad things going on, but he's just stepping out and listening to someone who's trying to do something about it. It's the thing that we can do. I ask for the Lord's Prayer in this matter in our community. God, in your mercy. Uh, I just want to thank God for the privilege of helping my mom move into a new home and to go through her things and, and uh, share. Um, she's so joyful to share what she has. She's downsizing to assisted living, and so it was so fun to be with my brothers and all our families, uh, and I just thank God for that privilege. God, in your joy. Holy One, we gather before you, sharing our voices together, and yet I know we have not lifted every concern. Let us be silent for a moment while we offer our hearts to God. And let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Now is the time where we offer our gifts to God. gave himself for us, God, will never equal that with our gifts. Our gifts will never pay you back, but they can say, thank you, God. And as we give our lives for others, we let you know that we understand. So accept our gifts, God of grace, and use our lives however you choose. Amen. We'll now do the sending hymn, Joyful, Joyful, in the United Methodist Hymnal, number 89. 